who are, who are there. And please be with us for the whole day. And may your Holy Spirit will be with us as we worship you. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Ah, you know, the thing about sitting up front, I don't see everybody came in. So when I sat down this morning and started looking up front, there was only six or seven of us here. So it's really nice to look out and see everybody here this morning. Ah, you know, um, in, in the last week, I, I guess it was, yeah, last week, we were in Romans, the 12th chapter, and verses 9 through 21. And we saw where Paul describes that, uh, what living as a Christian is, should look like. Well, in our study, we came to realize that the only way that we can live as Paul is describing and suggesting there in Romans 12 is when we walk in the Spirit. Our goal as Christians is to reflect the character of Christ. Amen? That is our goal, right? Y'all are with me so far this morning. I'm just getting started, so, you know, I just want to make sure you're with me. All right. <clears throat> So, but in order to do that, it is definitely necessary to have a close connection with our Lord. Because as, we, as I said last week, and as we look through what he was asking, I mean, it's impossible to do on our own. I mean, just take, for instance, verse 14 of chapter 12, where he said, Bless those who persecute you. I'm sure that we can all do that, right? I mean, it's so easy to do that. And, and to make it even worse, in verse 17, he says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Believe me, we can't do that without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And now we come to chapter 13. Here in chapter 13, Paul says, let me address how Christians should view the government. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> we're very fortunate to, to live in a nation with so many freedoms, and yet we have so many opinions concerning the government. How is the Christian to relate to the government. Well, before we go there, I, I want to share with you a story that's in the life of David, and that story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm not going to ask you to go there, but I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, in, in this particular incident, um, it occurred during a very difficult time in David's life. David was number one on King Saul's most wanted list. The problem began after David had valiantly defeated Goliath. The victory made David a, a, a national hero. The, uh, but it also stirred hatred and jealousy in the heart of Saul. Saul saw, uh, saw the anointing of God on David's life, and, and he saw the favor that, that God had given David with the people, and he saw David as a threat to his position as king. And therefore, he set out to kill David. And David had to run for his life. Once while he was in the palace, Saul threw a spear at him, just barely missed him. Saul was so obsessed with killing David and had 
unjustly chased him all over the country. Well, in, in chapter 24, God providentially places King Saul at the mercy of David. Saul and, say, about 3,000 of his soldiers arrived at a cave in in Gadi. He had heard that David had been seen in that area, so he gathered his soldiers and they went to En Gedi. Not knowing that David and his men were hiding in the back of a cave, King Saul went to that very cave to use the bathroom. He laid his coat aside and at that moment David could have easily killed him and seized the kingdom. But he didn't, because David understood some things about authority that protected him from making a terrible mistake. You see, under the prodding of his soldiers, his soldiers wanted him to kill King Saul, right? This is your moment, David, kill him. But David wouldn't do it, so he cut the corner of Saul's garment. And even that small small um, violation of Saul brought a great conviction in David's heart. He knew that even that act represented disrespect toward the king's throne. And it's in this context that David makes this statement that we find in verse 10 of chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. This day, David is saying, speaking to Saul, you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. You know, if there was ever a person who had a right to oppose the authority over him, it was David. After all, hadn't David been anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel? I mean, David had been totally loyal to Saul. He sang songs for Saul to ease his temperament. Saul had used his position of authority to make David's life miserable. Even though David had even risked his own life in battle for Saul. As I said, God had already rejected Saul as king of Israel, but the wheels of God's justice... They grind slowly sometimes, don't they? And Saul still had the office. Have you ever, and think about this, have you ever had authority over you like King Saul? Someone like that. Maybe it was a boss. Or or, or maybe it was just somebody else. Maybe even a relative or something. And, and, but let's say it's a boss, and this boss used his authority for personal advantage and abuse under him, such as happened with Mr. Johnson. For 30 years, he had arrived at work at 9 a.m. on the dot, never late. He never missed a day. Consequently, when one day, in particular that Uh, 9 o'clock came and passed, and Mr. Johnson hadn't shown up for work. It really caused kind of a sensation around the office. All work ceased, and the boss himself, looking at his watch and muttering, came out of the hall every now and then to check and see if Mr. Johnson was there. And finally, precisely at 10 o'clock, he showed up. Clothes dusty and torn, his face scratched and bruised, his glasses bent. He limped painfully to the time clock, punched in, and said, because he was aware that everybody was looking at him now, 
I tripped and rolled down two flights of stairs in the subway, nearly killing myself. And the boss said, and to roll down two flights of stairs took you a whole hour? That kind of situation really tests our hearts, doesn't it? David was going through some hard testing, some serious training on the subject of authority. How do we react to authority? Well, today we want to look at what God has to say from Romans, the 13th chapter, on the subject of governing authority. So please take your Bibles and turn to Romans, the 13th chapter. We want to look this morning at verses 1 through 7. Romans 13 and verses 1 through 7. We ready? I'm going to read from the New International Version. It says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do... So those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So here's the question. Is Paul teaching us here in Romans, the 13th chapter, that a Christian must give absolute obedience to the governing authorities? I mean... What if it's someone like Hitler or Saddam Hussein or Castro or some of the others that we have seen misuse authority in our world today? You know, it's, it's a very important question because one day, even in this country, they are going to make laws that are going to affect Christians' relationship with God, and, and they're going to enforce them. Maybe the government will use Romans 13.1 as a basis for our obedience and say, you see, even the Bible says you have to obey what the government says. So it's important that we understand what Paul is saying, isn't it? First, let's look at the context in which uh, Paul has written this passage. Remember when Paul wrote th this statement and the, the Roman Christians, uh, to the Roman Christians, he was writing to Christians that were uh, in a government that was actually anti-Christian. And even though some persecution was happening, it was beginning, but it had not yet really reached the, the full potential, shall I say, as it was going to, because later on it was this same government that martyred Christians. So why did Paul make this statement? 
Why did he say, as Christians, we must be subject to the governing authorities? Well, I want to draw your attention back to a statement that Paul made in Romans 12 and verse 2. That Paul knew would probably be misunderstood. He said there in verse 2 of Romans 12, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I believe that Paul realized that some Christians in Rome might say, since we don't belong to this world, and we are not to conform to the world, we don't have to obey the governments of the world. We don't have to pay taxes. Wouldn't that be great, not to pay taxes? Hmm. So Paul's trying to make it clear. It's important that you and I also understand what Paul is saying so that we do not jump to the same conclusions that some of the Christians in Rome might have jumped to. He's not discussing the, discussing the Christian attitude toward governors and governments in every respect. In our text, he's speaking to a specific area an area of law and order. Now, what Paul is saying is that because of the sinful world that we live in, it is essential that God put restrictions and begins to curb evil, right? Because if he didn't, we would have wiped ourselves out long ago. Let me give you an example. We here in Florida have experienced some really bad hurricanes. But not just Florida. Texas, Louisiana has also experienced some very bad hurricanes. California and other areas have experienced some really bad earthquakes, right? Well, whenever these bad hurricanes or earthquakes happen, we find that the government sends in soldiers and the police force is increased, isn't it? Why do they do that? It's because of what people would do. They would take advantage of the situation and there would be looting, wouldn't there? You see, that's the sinful nature in man. I know that there are those, I know Marxism say, uh, wants to say that, that man is getting, that man is basically good and that it's his environment that causes him to be evil, but that's not true. Because of the nature of sin, man is naturally bent toward evil. Paul is saying that God had ordained civil authorities to keep this world in law and order to curb crime. Can can you just imagine what would happen to this country as well as others without civil authority? I want you to look at verses 2 through 4 again in Romans 13. Consequently, He who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And then he gives an example, uh, he explains what he meant. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then Do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an angel of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. In other words, as soon as this world became sinful, 
God ordained governments. He ordained civil authorities to restrict the evil practices of sinful man. Paul is saying that Christians should be good, loyal citizens. He gives the reason why in verse 5. Look at it. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So a Christian must do what is right because he wants to do what is right. Not because he's afraid of the police or afraid of, of the, the, what the government might do. Look at verses 6 and 7. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I wish Paul had never said the part about paying taxes. You know, <laughs> I had a, a, a church member one time that insisted that it was not necessary to pay income tax, that the government did not have a right to force us to pay income tax. I tried to reason with him, but it didn't do any good. So I ask you, was he right in making that statement? I mean, it would help us all in our income you know, in our pocketbooks, wouldn't it, if we didn't have to pay taxes? But do we have to do that? Paul says we do. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark, the 12th chapter. Mark, the 12th chapter. We find a story here about a group of Pharisees that had come to Jesus. And we want to look at verses 13 through 17. Mark 12, verses 13 through 17. Now they came to trick Jesus, but I want you to notice how he responded. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a Daenerys and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this whose and whose inscription Caesar's they replied then Jesus said to them give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's I guess we should pay taxes shouldn't we you see Paul and Jesus are both saying yes Pay your taxes because these men, even though some of them do evil things, are agents of God. The truth is, there are two kingdoms in this world. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. We have to be subject to both. But here comes the problem. Which kingdom is superior, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of men? What happens when the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man clash in their demands? Again, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts, the fifth chapter this time. Acts chapter 5, we want to begin with verse 28. Acts, the fifth chapter. Verse 
beginning with verse 28. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, the disciples are standing before the Sanhedrin. They have healed uh, a lame man who was at the gate. And now they are called before the Sanhedrin for preaching and, and, and all. And, uh, and you understand that the Sanhedrin is the governing body of the Jewish nations. I want you to notice what they say to the disciples. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with... My wife always goes where she shouldn't. I just <laughs> okay. Now that was what they told the disciples. That was the command. It was coming from the highest Jewish authority. Now I want you to look at verse 29. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. When there is a clash between God's ways and man's ways, then we must put God first. Amen? Well, the Sanhedrin, they didn't quite like that answer, and so they had a committee meeting, and uh, Gamaliel, he speaks to them, and I want you to look at verse 40. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now I want you to notice what the disciples did after their release in verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name for the name of Jesus. Not only should we put God first, but also if it involves punishment, it in, or if it involves, involves imprisonment, we should be happy to suffer for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may, me, you may remember that Paul himself was flogged, wasn't he? He was imprisoned because he preached Jesus and, and because he disobeyed the government in that particular area. But the disciples not only rejoiced, look at verse 42. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. In this respect, they defied the government, didn't they? But why? Just to be rebellious? No. They, ought, they said we ought to obey God rather than man. Paul is saying in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, that God has ordained civil authorities to keep law and order in every country and in every state. So how should a Christian relate to these rules and regulations which, you know, we should obey them, not out of fear, but because we as, Christ, as Christians believe in good and do not believe in evil. But when the time comes that the government goes beyond that authority and makes laws that oppose the God of heaven, then we have to do what Daniel did. We have to do what the apostles did. We have to do what Paul himself did. 
We have to obey God rather than men, no matter what it costs. On the one hand, we should be loyal citizens, but only as long as our loyalty does not infringe on our loyalty to God. We live in a wonderful country. Men and women served and fought and died to preserve the freedoms that we sometimes take for granted. Police, firefighters, AMTs put their lives on the line every day for the citizens of this great nation. We must always give them the respect and the honor due to them. So whether we agree with the president or not, whether we agree with Congress or not, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, we must never forget that God is sovereign and he is in control. So Paul is saying in Romans 13, as Christians, our loyalty to our government and this great nation must never be questioned. But according to Revelation 13, the day will come when the law of the state will conflict with the law of God. When that happens, we are to say as the disciples, we, must, uh, we have to obey God rather than men. Paul's not saying that we ought to give explicit, unquestioning obedience to the government of man only. We are to do this only in terms of what is right and wrong. Yes, it's true that our freedoms in this country was bought with the blood of our ancestors. But we must also never forget that Jesus set us free by his blood, which purchased our home in heaven. Jesus paid the price so that you and I could be citizens of a heavenly kingdom, which takes precedent over earthly authority. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the freedoms and the opportunity that you have given us to live in this great nation. Father, I thank you for the governments that you have placed and put in place. I just pray for those men, those women. Pray for our president and for each member of Congress Lord, I know that your Holy Spirit has, has worked hard day and night. You have held back the, wings, the, the winds of strife in order to give us all an opportunity to come into a relationship with you. Father, fill us with your Spirit. While we still have time, may we share Jesus to those who don't know him. May we be a tool in your hand to do the work you have called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.